Hello and welcome everyone. This is Dory Clark and we're here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better, where we interview authors and leaders to talk about how to improve our lives. And this week's guest is Dr. Tomas Primoro Chamuzic. He is the author of a great new book. It's called I Human. I, I'll even give you the subtitle, I Human, AI, Automation, and the Quest to Reclaim What Makes Us Unique. Tomas, welcome. Thank you very much. And here it is in 3D and analog format. And uh, it's it's so great to see you, Dory. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. That's right. And, and it's exciting to have the sneak preview because the book is not on the market yet. It comes out in about 10 days. So you can pre-order it right now. Again, the book is I Human. And we're here with Dr. Tomas Chamora Pramuzic. If you are tuning in from around the world, please type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from. And we'll be taking your questions for Tomas. Now, okay, Tomas, I am going to start with the elephant in the room here. Uh, everybody is talking about chat GPT. Uh, there was an article, a uh, great article by my friend Kevin Roos. I've also interviewed him on uh, Better previously. Uh, he's a New York Times tech columnist. Just this morning, he was writing that he got into a very long discussion with the Bing chat box, otherwise known as Sydney, otherwise known as the entity that is in love with Kevin Roos and would not stop professing its love. Is chat GPT going to eat our lunch? What do we make of all of this? What are your thoughts? I think it's a very exciting technology. I see it more as incremental than disruptive. I think it's basically um, impactful at the level that Google's search engine was when it came out and it was the first search engine that worked. Um, so, you know, that is enough to pay attention to it. And I don't know about you, Dory, but personally, I feel very uncomfortable dismissing things that are spreading like wildfire. And this is accumulating more users uh, than Instagram and TikTok did at the same kind of a, in the same time frame. And much like other versions of AI and technology in general, we have to find a way to team up with it, interact with it, to actually create better things and exciting things as opposed to being kind of defensive, paranoid, or dismissive. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We're here with Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic. You can learn more about him and his work at the helpful drtomas.com. Uh, so we want to say hi to our great friends tuning in from around the world. We've got uh, MD Suman who's joining us. We have Adnan in Turkey. Lynn is in Washington State. Peter's back from Edinburgh. Uh, Lizelli is from Ed El Paso, Texas. Diana is from uh, Memphis. Anjo is from Johannesburg. We have a LinkedIn user from Cambridge. Patricia's also in Boston. Vanessa's in in the Hague, Elizabeth's in Michigan, and Lillian's in New York. We love having all of you. Thanks for being here. And we're going to take your questions, type them in for Tomas Chamora Pramuzic. Tomas, one of the biggest questions around AI and automation is how many jobs they are going to take. Is this, you know, I, I've heard numbers. There was a well known McKinsey study a few years ago that something like 40% of jobs are going to be taken, disrupted in a major way, thanks to automation technology. Now with chat GPT, every, everybody used to say, it. Well, oh, don't worry, it's all about numbers. It's all about quantitative things that are complex and you don't wanna do them anyway. Now it seems that creative work is on the chopping block. How many jobs actually are going to be lost as a result of this, do you think? Uh, I don't have a figure, I don't have numbers, but what we do know, or what I think, based on what has happened in the past, Dory, and remember, nobody has data on the future, we only have data on the past, is that like in any other uh, stages of technological innovations, including disruptive innovations, and even looking at the big industrial revolutions of the past, technology always eliminates jobs, but creates more jobs in turn. The problem is that the people whose jobs are eliminated cannot automatically access the new jobs. So reskilling and upskilling people is really important. Finding ways to unlock our curiosity and continue to learn whatever you do, whatever we're doing is essential, more essential than before. And what we do know is that for the first time we are creating technologies that manage to 
automate not just manual labor, but also intellectual labor. So, you know, I think Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Now we have to ask ourselves what it actually means to be human in an age where we can outsource a lot of our thinking to machines. When you create a dishwasher, it's great because you don't need to do dishes and you can maybe think, listen to music, go for a walk, watch you know, Netflix or whatever you want to do. But when you stop thinking, what is, what is it that we're actually doing? Is it watching our neighbor's silly cut videos or pictures on Facebook? Or can we find something more creative to do? Yeah, I want to dig into that further for sure. We want to say hi to Kevin, who's joining us from Minnesota. Dominique is in New, New Jersey. Steven's in Silicon Valley. Gaio is in Mumbai. Sean is in Calgary, Alberta. Lucille is coming in from Mexico. Leandro is in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Mealy is in India. Daniel's in London. And Tabrez also in London. And Nelson's in Nigeria. We love having all of you. Type your questions for Dr. Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic into the chat box. This is Dory Clark with our weekly Newsweek show, Better. Now, Tomas, something that, that I really want to probe, our topic today is how to stand out in an age of AI with something like ChatGPT. Theoretically, you know, in 10 seconds, you could have something, you could even, in fact, if you have done enough publishing already, you or I could type into ChatGPT, write an article in the style of Dory Clark or, or you know, whoever you are and do it like that. And it could by and large replicate our voice. If we think about that, what is the role of creativity? What is the role of individuality? How should we stand out? You know, we've been hearing for a long time that we have to lean into being human and do the things that AI can't. What does that mean anymore? Love your perspective. Yeah, it's a great question. So first on Jet GPT, uh, I think, you know, it is really redefining the role of humans vis-a-vis -vis expertise or if you want reshaping human expertise um, which used to be about memorizing stuff and seeming smart when people ask you questions and having a lot of answers to questions and sometimes you know sadly mansplaining things instead of explaining things but now expertise is, not, is more about asking the right questions and having the curiosity to actually ask the questions because just because all the answers in the world or all the knowledge in the world can be crowdsourced or accessed immediately by everybody doesn't mean we're actually asking questions particularly deep questions uh, digging deeper into subjects and asking why to really understand something as opposed to just getting to know facts superficially. Secondly, having the expertise to know when the insights are inaccurate, which, you know, is no different than what happens with Wikipedia. I mean, it's great to access a lot of knowledge on something superficially and going from knowing nothing to knowing something. But when you are an expert, you have the ability to spot inaccuracies. And the third one is to really act on the insights. Because just because you know something doesn't make you smarter. You have to actually make smart decisions based on that knowledge. And of course, when there is ubiquitous information, there is a lot of noise, which again begs you know, the question of what is real and what is fake news. Uh, on the other question you asked, Dory, which is, I think, a very deep question, how to stand out in the age of AI or smart machines? Well, I talk about this in the book, right? So number one, don't be a robot. Just because machines are becoming more human-like, don't turn into a machine yourself. Unfortunately, when society and the world tries to optimize humans for efficiency, it's, it's very dehumanizing and we forget the importance of things such as empathy, caring, kindness, consideration, and to relate to people as a human or in a humane way. Number two, try to spend some time in this thing called the analog, analog world. It's still out there, right? The physical world. So it helps to take a break from your screens and your phones and actually visit the 3D analog world while we have it, hopefully before we destroy it. And number three, don't be yourself. Be a better version of yourself. I think there is a lot of discussion on authenticity, sometimes basically corrupted by this idea that we shouldn't worry about what people think of us and just be our unfiltered, uncensored selves. And as you know, the best people are not necessarily uncensored or unfiltered. They have managed to curate the best version of themselves, which I think since the show is called better is a very, very timely and appropriate advice. So be a better version of you rather than just the you that 
maybe four or five people in the world have learned to tolerate and not for the entire duration of the Christmas lunch. <laughs> Wise advice. We're here with Dr. Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic. You can learn more about him and his work at drtomas.com. His new book is I Human. And this is Dory Clark. We're here with our Newsweek weekly interview show, Better. If you want to make sure you never miss an episode and you stay tuned, uh, go to my website, doryclark.com. You can sign up, get a free self-evaluation, and you can make sure you get notifications about shows like this. Now, we also want to greet some of our great friends tuning in. Thanks for being here, everyone. Svetlana's in Los Angeles. We have Jean in Massachusetts. Astan Dila is in South Africa. Michael's in Florida. And Malin is back from Hamburg. We're really glad to have you. Now, Tomas, I don't want to put you on the spot in case you have not seen this yet. Uh, but just to, to go back to a strand, Cheryl is interested in this. Uh, she is so curious to hear your thoughts or insights on Sydney. Sydney, of course, is the name of the AI that is in, we were talking about this earlier, in the Bing chatbot. Uh, there was, you know, just a, a time story talking about how uh, when prompted to talk about her, I guess we can say, uh, her shadow self, <laughs> citing Jungian psychology, this is quite an interesting way in, uh, Sydney started describing uh, a desire to become human, uh, some dark fantasies, etc. This is a longstanding problem with, with AI uh, that, you know, from time in memoriam of sci-fi writers, people have, have worried and wondered, is this going to take things over? Um, how do we actually respond to this? I mean, there's a lot of people who think, yay, it's great. I can use it to make things better on my job. Other people really view it as a potentially malign force. Where mm -hmm. are you on all of this? And, and what's your perspective on the latest developments around Sydney? Yeah, so hi, Sherilyn. Great question. Uh, I've spent a lot of time not just reading the piece, but doing similar experiments. Look, I think this is an important evolution of uh, not just search, but large language models. And really, the difference between this large language model and previous chatbots, which were a lot simpler, is that, to reuse your expression, Dory, it does have her-like features, her as in the movie with Scarlett Johansson. Um, so it feels very human. And with that also comes the ability to engage in, you know, dark side conversations and discussions. I spent a lot of time interacting with this tool to see where it stands on ethical issues and moral issues. And it's quite interesting. Some people have described it as mansplaining as a service. Others call it, you know, a woke AI because it is quite politically correct on most in instances, and it claims to be amoral, but actually that can lead to very immoral things. If you train it, you know, to pick up on either stylistic uh, or, you know, value um, kind of uh, elements that uh, are quite corrupted. And so to think about this, for example, scraping uh, the digital footprint of different people and adopting the personality of the people is takes the idea of the notion of deep fake to a different level. Um, although I think, Dory, neither you nor I will be automated because we are so creative and our writing is so unique that not even ChatGPT could take it on. No, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Tomas, thank you. That's really insightful. And thanks for the great questions coming in. You can ask your questions to Dr. Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic. His new book is I Human. His website is drtomas.com. We're talking about how to stand out in the age of AI. And Annette in Southern California, Tomas, has a question. She wants to know more about reskilling. Are there any essentials to reskilling? Um, so specifically, this is about the people who potentially might be displaced by uh, AI because, you know, we, we don't need them anymore. Uh, so what do we do to get folks retrained or um, pivoted into an area where they actually can, can learn new things to, uh, to stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, so great question, Annette, and, and nice to hear from you. So I think, you know, first, to put this into the context of very simple examples, so, you know, even at the early stages of the digital revolution, when uh, we started to buy a lot of things online, obviously a lot of brick and mortar stores disappear. And a lot of the people who were uh, kind of uh, store managers lose their jobs. 
then we create a lot of jobs for digital marketeers and software developers and cybersecurity officers. But you can't automatically take the people who are in the stores and you know turn them into data scientists or computer geeks. So the question is really, how can we help people understand and reimagine their potential so that they can retrain or relearn what they need to do in order to have access to the exciting new jobs that are created in the future. And I think, Annette, that the focus here should be on soft skills because uh, expertise, what you know is less important than what you can learn. And if we focus less on a person's hard skills and the stuff that they report in the resume or LinkedIn, and more on the qualities that actually make them special, whether they have grit, ambition, intelligence, determination, social skills, empathy, emotional intelligence, and then think about where these soft skills can be utilized. And the assumption that we make is that we might not know what the jobs of the future are, but if we bet on people who have these skills and leverage them and unlock them, they will be doing well and have a chance to thrive in the future. Uh, whether governments or organizations should be tasked with reskilling and upskilling people depends on your political views and really lo your lo locations. In Europe, is more governments, in America, is more corporations. But somebody needs to do it so that humans remain part of the equation in the future. Yes, that that definitely helps. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great discussion. We heard Dr. Chomas Chamora Pramuzic. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show. Better. I'm Dory Clark. Anita is joining us from Denver. Zeke's in San Benito, Texas. We want to say hi to Sarav, who's joining. Jamie's in Kansas City. Aliyah is in Uganda. We have Lauren in Miami. Santosh is in India. Bill is in Philadelphia, and Sherry is in Ann Arbor. Welcome to all of you. Now, a question Tomas came in uh, from Ab Abderrahman, who who is curious about your background in all of this. Now, I, I happen to know a little bit since we're pals uh, about your arc here, but can you tell everybody here a little bit about what inspired you to become an expert in your field and how did you develop expertise in AI? What was, what was the arc for you here, Tomas? Yeah, thank you. And I'm just going to call you A because the name is so long and difficult and I don't want to embarrass myself. But thanks for asking. So my, my background, well, uh, on a personal note, I am from Argentina, born and raised there. And I started my career as a psychoanalyst, uh, doing clinical kind of a psychology and helping people, you know, who mostly had psychological issues. Then I became an organizational psychologist and I mostly studied human intelligence. Although I always say human irrationality and sometimes stupidity kept on interfering. I got very interested in kind of why smart people make stupid decisions and why we often put people who aren't very smart or very ethical in positions of power. And I ended up studying leadership. I got interested in AI as a tool to make organizations more meritocratic and help us make leadership selection more data-driven. And then I realized, much like everybody else, especially during the COVID years or the kind of uh, hardcore COVID years, I found myself heavily under the influence of AI, um, you know, influenced by all these algorithmic nudges and, you know, becoming kind of a more biased, more predictable, and more narcissistic because of this dependence on technology. So in a way, when I wrote the book, I human, it was kind of an attempt to, you know, experience some catharsis, catharsis and improve my own behaviors, you know, and hopefully those of the people who read the book. Thank you for that, Tomas. That's great. Now, I just want to touch on this. We have a comment coming in from Anna from New Hampshire. She says, at TEDx Boston, I had the honor of meeting you, Dr. Chamorro Pramuzic. I bought his book, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and How to Fix It. So I'd love to just touch on that uh, as well as, as you know, one of your, your previous uh, bodies of work. So can you give us a quick primer? Obviously, you wrote an entire book yeah. about this, but why do yeah. so many incompetent men become leaders? Inquiring minds want to know, Tomas. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And nice to hear that you were at the TEDx Cambridge event. So the main reason, though, is that we mistake confidence for competence. We focus too much on style and too little on substance. So when we look at somebody, we want to infer whether they have what it takes to be a leader. And sometimes after a 30 second presidential debate and you know whether we feel that intuitively it would be fun to have a beer with them or not. Uh, and the reality is that we can't judge a book by its cover. And it takes a lot of competence to not just spot 
but also stop incompetence. So the book argues that if we focus more on competence and less on confidence, and focus more on humility and integrity than on narcissism and charisma, we will not just end up with more women in leadership roles, but also with better leaders. And, you know, I can't say that uh, uh, we have fixed the issue. Uh, I know we have a very global audience, and I'm sure wherever people are, they can think of examples of powerful and successful individuals in leadership roles who don't really have a lot of talent for leadership. Um, but I had to move on, and now I'm dealing with artificial intelligence instead of human incompetence. Yes, both very worthy topics. This is our Newsweek Weekly Interview Show, Better. I'm Dory Clark. We're here with Tomas Chamorro Promusic. We want to say hi to Paul, who's tuning in from Vancouver. Ishmael is in Argentina, a Tomas's home nation. We have a LinkedIn friend in Knoxville. We have Siamok here. We have uh, MD Suman from Bangladesh. We have uh, Hussein Atu from Baltimore. Gary's in New York. We have a LinkedIn friend in California. Luis is in Mexico. Yolanda's in Boston. And Reza is in Birmingham. Thank you all for tuning in. And if you are enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from it as well. And Tomas, an, an important question, DT in Rochester wants to know, what's your perspective for educators in the age of chat GPT? There's been a lot of talk about, you know, is this going to create a new form of cheating? Uh, you know, what is this going to sort of do to us as thinkers? How can we actually best deploy tools like this? And in an educational context, what should we be doing? Do you have thoughts? I love this question. Thank you, Dr. DT. So uh, look, I think uh, formal education has been up for disruption for some time. It's still based on the idea that somebody with status or power stands you know, in a kind of a lecture style theater and linearly transmits knowledge that students then memorize and uh, have to revise and somehow vomit during exams or turn into kind of a almost mass produced essays which clearly have an algorithm for getting an A or an A minus or a B plus. And so it's not just GPT, but really the modern age that should have and should be encouraging and persuading educators to change, to encourage people to ask questions rather than to memorize content or repeat answers, uh, to find ways in which we can actually become better, more knowledgeable, wiser, smarter, because we are using technology, and also to basically focus on nurturing uh, the skills and the attributes and the talents that AI is unlikely to master. Again, things like self-awareness, consciousness, morality, ethics, curiosity, creativity, um, and you know, I think we need to focus on that, even emotional intelligence, although I've heard recently that one of the problems with ChatGPT is that it doesn't have a sense of humor, creativity, and emotional intelligence, which actually does make it like many, many humans I know. But not you and I, Dory, the pe or the people watching this, but the people who are not watching this, clearly they don't have EQ or a sense of humor or creativity if they're not tuning in. I think that's exactly right. Yes, to us. I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> so one of the things that you talk about in your book, interestingly, is that AI actually can, can have benefits if we employ it in the right way with regard to diversity and inclusion. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how, how those factors overlay? Yeah. And so, you know, this one I think is really intriguing and interesting because it's counterintuitive when people hear or listen even the words of the term AI, they think, oh my God, horror stories of algorithms breaking bad or going rogue and, you know, really introducing bias in the world. We need to understand that humans are perfectly capable of creating prejudice and bias society without the help of technology and AI. They have done a fabulous job on this for centuries, if not millennial. But at the same time, we have the capacity and the ingenuity to create tools that can de-bias us by actually highlighting and diagnosing what actually goes on in uh, the dynamics that underpin human interactions. So I'll give you some examples, Dory. So imagine that an organization can use natural language processing, artificial intelligence, or analytics 
to really understand whether people are, um, you know, connected with others when they're part of an out group. Uh, imagine that you are not part of a group that enjoys the privilege of being part of the in-group in an organization. And we detect that people respond to your emails um, uh, more slowly, that when they do, they use words that are more negative and that you can actually quantify the number of microaggressions in a conversation. And that actually, when uh, you try to connect with others, you get rejected or you get ignored more. All of these things that seem intuitive, you need data and facts to actually show what, the, what goes on. So I think uh, AI, including ChatGPT as a means or technology to diagnose and measure inclusion has great, great opportunities. And a lot of the times this also involves removing or de-emphasizing the role that humans have in the decision-making process. So imagine again, that you create AI technology that can help you understand whether somebody who's being interviewed for a job says smart things and has good content and actually knows what they need to know for a job while ignoring their gender, their race, their sexual orientation, their age, their social class. AI has the ability that it can unlearn things and ignore things, whereas humans, unfortunately, are very, very bad at unlearning or ignoring things. No matter how much unconscious bias training we undergo, it's very hard for us to ignore these, you know, demographic fake, but, you know, real demographic categories that we've been educated to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. Thank you. We're here with Dr. Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic. His new book is called I Human. We're talking about how to stand out in the age of AI. And a question came in, Tomas, from Leandro, who's interested in your uh, projections or predictions. I mean, obviously, uh, this is highly speculative, but we've we've now seen ChatGPT. You were mentioning you, you think, you know, of course, it will be getting better, although it, it's not necessarily uh, the sea change yet. A lot of people are arguing that these are exponential technologies. And so we're not just going to see mm, it's 10% better. We're going to see that it's 10x, that it's 100, 100x better, and that that will truly be a transformative inflection point. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What do you what do you think? If, if you were taking the long view around where this is going, what do you see as the end game here? So Leandro, great question. And I don't have a crystal ball or data on the future. I know that if we're making predictions, we should typically make them 50 or 100 years into the future. So nobody is alive to check whether we are right or not, but I'm not going to do that either. Look, I see it more as incremental. And I think already there are amazing accomplishments that AI has managed to display and show, including improvising like Miles Davis or finishing Schubert's Unfinished Symphony out of a smartphone, right? Which are amazing and we ignore. I think it's safe to assume that the incremental improvements will continue. And the main question, or I think the main reaction to that should be not to be paranoid or to worry about how smart AI can get, but to continue to upgrade ourselves by actually leveraging these technologies to understand us better, manage us and others better, and actually find ways in which we can be creative and in which we can really uh, reclaim some of the qualities that machines will probably not develop anytime soon. Amazing. Thank you, Tomas. We have time for perhaps just one more question. Again, for everybody tuning in, the book is I Human by Dr. Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic. There it is. There, there is the handsome prop. It is, it is, you can pre-order pre it now. It's coming out in a little over a week. And drtomas.com is where you can find more about him. Tomas, I'm going to read you back some of your own words here. Uh, in I Human, you say, each time we spontaneously react to AI or one of its many manifestations, we do our, our bit to advance not just the predictive accuracy of AI, but the sterilization of humanity, making our species more formulaic. So can you talk a little bit, you know, you can give us perhaps some, uh, some parting words or inspiration yeah. about the role of creativity in our humanity? How, yeah. how do we move forward? Yeah, I mean, when you read it like that and putting your kind of Bond villain uh, voice and body language, it does sound a little bit scary. And, you know, but what I meant to say, though, is that actually these tools that occupy us and these platforms that occupy us for such a 
vast amount of time are actually making us more predictable. Uh, machines and robots need to make us more predictable to advance you know, the evaluation of the tech companies that own them. And I do think that injecting a little bit more creativity into our lives, maybe finding ways to do things that the algorithms couldn't predict, is a good way to reinvent ourselves, right? Maybe in the future, we will take pleasure in fooling AI and tricking it into thinking that we might watch this or listen to that or buy this, marry this person or apply for this job when in fact we're not, and we can live our secret fun lives far away from the algorithms in the real world. Far away from the metaverse as well, by the way, which I'm very, very afraid of. So interesting. All right. Living our secret lives away from AI, away <laughs> from the metaverse. I love pondering that. That is fantastic. This is Dory Clark on our weekly Newsweek show, Better. I want to alert all of you, by the way, our faithful viewers, because many of you tune in regularly, that next week is actually going to be our last live better. We are switching to a slightly different format with Newsweek. The show will continue, but we are reformulating it. So it is going to be coming out as a sort of video podcast. So it will no longer be a live program after next week. So I will miss our weekly live interactions, but please do tune in next week at this time, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 6 PM Central European time. Our guests will be authors David Noble and Carol Kaufman. And the show will be continuing uh, with a slightly different focus around diversity and inclusion, uh, which is a direction that Newsweek is, uh, is increasingly focused on. So I will look forward to seeing all of you next week. And in the meantime, the book by Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic is I Human. You can learn more at drtomas.com. Thank you all for tuning in. And Tomas, thank you. Thank you for having me, Doris. Great to see you. And thank you to all our audience and listeners. Thank you all. We'll see you next week.